You know I've traveled near and far to see the shining sea. I've seen a lot of places, and people that were nice to me. One place that's in my heart, and this is how I feel. I'm talking about my hometown, Fayetteville. She's nestled in the sand hills on a river called Cake Field. Special to so many who proudly served our country here. She was named for Lafayette and known for cotton mills. I'm talking about my hometown, Fayetteville. Take long when you're away from home to find out how you feel. It's always good to come home to Fayetteville. Babe Ruth hit his first one, heard around the world. Sherman marched with the Union and burned the arsenal. Old Market House still standing, but stands for freedom's will. I'm talking about my hometown, Fayetteville. Take long when you're away from home to find out how you feel. It's always good to come home to Fayetteville, my all American city, Fayetteville. Talking about my hometown, Fayetteville. Good evening. I'd like to call this Monday, December 8th meeting of the regular uh, meeting of the Fayetteville City Council to order and um, ask uh, Dr. Maxie Dobson to come forward, who's the senior pastor of Tabernacle of Miracles Church. Oh, thank you. Uh, would you would you come forward and lead us with invocation, and then remain up there for a minute, if you would? And I want to hear more about your uh, your ministry. Okay. All right, count, uh, if everyone would please stand for the uh, for the prayer and the uh, pledge of allegiance. Following, please. Let us bow our heads. Heavenly Father, first of all, we give you thanks for being you, one who invites to be asked of, one who grants the privilege to come boldly before your throne to obtain help in any matter. We give you thanks, Father, for our community and those who serve it, and in particular, our city council. We thank you for the sacrifices made to facilitate the quality of life we enjoy. As we begin our meeting this evening, we ask you to help, for only thereby will we be able to maximize the opportunities before us. 
Finally, Father, bless individually and bless collectively that the increasing greatness of our community that can be realized will be and that we will never forget to acknowledge it's you that should be praised. This we ask for your namesake and for your glory. Amen. Dr. Dodson, tell us something about the Tabernacle of Miracles. The Tabernacle of Miracles, Mary, is located at uh, 2574 Hope Mills Road, and uh, I have served there as a senior pastor since uh, the fourth Sunday of February 1999, so come this coming February, I will celebrate my sweet 16th anniversary, and I'm grateful about that. And uh, for anyone that does not have a church home, come and see us. And at, where on uh, Hope Mills Road are you located? 2574. Where, what is that near? Or uh, that if you pass through the intersection of Cumberland Road, going to Warish, uh, Hope Mills is right on the right. Right. Uh, the uh, Cumberland Mills Elementary School is on one side, and there's a Wiener Works restaurant on the other sure. side. Great. Yes. Well, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you for having me. Yes, sir. I'd like to uh, give proper notice that we have our Mayor Pro Tem, Katie Ann Davey, live on the telephone. Can you hear us? I sure can. Great. <laughs> You're missing a fun time. Was that green? I know. <laughs> I miss you all. <laughs> well, thanks. Stand by. We've got some exciting stuff coming up. Um, would like to recognize one of our own at this point, and that is our city clerk, Miss McGill, who has won some recognition. And I'd love for uh, love for you to tell everybody about it, so we we can hear your great accent. Oh. <laughs> um. Well, I was awarded the uh, Master Municipal Clerk Certification from the uh, International Institute of Municipal Clerks. Okay. And I tease, uh, tease Miss McGill about, well, I don't know if I tease you about it, but I make sure that everybody knows that the, uh, according to the North Carolina, uh, uh, I don't know, whatever the rules are that we all abide by, the only position that is mandatory for any city to have is a city clerk. So I often tell her she's the most important person here. <laughs> and, and Mr. She Mayor, is. she owes all of her success to me. That's why I sit beside her. <laughs> Keep her straight. Does she cheat off of you, Councilmember Crisp? <laughs> well, congratulations, Ms. McGill. Thank you. Uh, where is Jay? Mr. Reinstein. Uh, is Miss Hill here this evening? Oh, great. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you this evening our brand new Director of Human Resources Development, Barbara Hill. She comes to us from Nashua, New Hampshire, and previously Ardmore, Oklahoma. Correct. Uh, she has a, a number of degrees, including a Juris Doctorate in uh, Employee Law, which will be very helpful in her uh, role as a HRD Director. Uh, we will always take our legal advice from our city attorney, however, but it's nice to have that extra training. Uh, and we're excited to have her here on board, so if you'll join me with a warm round of applause for Barbara Hill. Welcome, Ms. Hill. We won't put you on the spot tonight, but you can get warmed up for next time. <laughs> uh, at this time, I'd like to ask uh, Lieutenant Jason Bass with our fire department and also uh, Chief Sifford to come forward, please. Good evening, everyone. 
I'm honored and I'm privileged to present this award to such a deserving young man. Each year, the fire department recognizes an officer who has made the most significant contribution to the fire department. <coughs> the selection process, to give you a quick history of it, consists of a nomination period. Uh, during that period, nominations are forwarded to our Board of Merit. Uh, they consist of various members of the department. Their job is to review and select the best nomination based on outstanding performance. This year, the Board of Merit has selected an individual that has served the department's chaplain corps with the utmost commitment and professionalism, has attended funerals with family members, visited those in the hospital and nursing homes, showing compassion for those in need. This year's individual has served the citizens of Fayetteville, his community, and fellow employees with respect and dignity. This individual has been a mentor to the youth in this community, being a mentor and role model for all firefighters to follow to serve with respect and dedication. This individual has assisted the department with the tough task of conducting critical incident stress debriefings for the department when firefighters see things that tear at the heart. This individual has represented the department with honesty, kindness, trustworthiness, high standards of ethics and morals, loyalty, and love for one another. This individual has also shown pride in the department and city and everything that he does, and most of all, this individual has touched the lives of all those around him. I am honored to present the 2014 Fable Fire Emergency Management Department's Fire Officer of the Year, Lieutenant Jason Bass. At this time, let's talk about a rezoning I've got. No, I'm kidding. Uh, I didn't recognize Judge Pone in the audience. Uh, he is here with us. So, Judge, why don't you come on up? <laughs> Beverly, why don't you come up with the judge? It's good to see you guys. Welcome. Thank you. You may me. approach the bench. I appreciate it. <laughs> How are you? Um, what are we doing here? We want to recognize a very special young lady who on Saturday, December the 13th, will turn 100 years old. Is that this young lady in here? That is other than Mrs. Lucille Graham Mosley, the beautiful young lady seated right here. Miss Mosley, how are you? Good. Pretty good. You're doing great. <laughs> like Willard Scott. <laughs> Miss Bosley, I'd like to present this to you. It's a happy birthday wish from the entire city council and on behalf of over 208 of our citizens. Happy 100th birthday. May I, may I read this? Please, Mr. Chris. From the office of the mayor, happy 100th birthday, Miss Lucille Graham Mosley, December 13th, 2014. Happy birthday and best wishes as you celebrate your 100th birthday. As mayor of the great city of Fayetteville, and on behalf of city council and our more than 208,000 residents, I wish to congratulate and commend you for the many contributions you have made to your family, your friends, and to our great city. Your many years of service have truly made a difference and are greatly appreciated. I hope that the celebration and honoring of you on your special day is one in which you truly enjoy and are sharing with those you hold dear. Happy birthday, Lucille Graham Mosley. May you be blessed with health, happiness, and prosperity Sincerely, and it's signed, Nat Robinson, Mayor of the City of Fayetteville. Mr. Mayor, I move that we sing happy birthday to this wonderful lady. Second. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. 
Happy birthday to you. Oh, wow. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Judge. Good to see you, man. We'll give about 60 seconds before we start the uh, business for the evening. Don't y'all rush, Miss Moley. She can take all the time she wants. All right, Council, I'd like to move now to item 4.0, uh, which is the approval of the agenda. Is there a motion to, uh, oh, I think I'm supposed to go to, motion to approve, Mr. Mayor. Mm-hmm. Um, well, we were, was going to pull that. Put this up we need to. You can make Was that you want to restate your motion? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I'd move that we approve the uh, agenda with the exception of item 6.04 at the request of some council members like to pull that for discussion. Okay. And Mr. Mayor, I believe um, we, we need to add an agenda item to continue the closed session upstairs okay. following this council meeting. All right. Before conclusion of this council meeting. Okay. So we'll... Uh, We'll add that as item 8.04. Yes. And that's a continuation of the closed session to discuss the litigation? Litigation with PwC, yes, sir. Okay. Council, is there uh, any questions pertaining to the motion? Seeing none, I'll ask for your vote, please. Green. I heard a faint green. I heard of Miss Davy Green over there. All right, Madam Clerk, that's unanimous. Uh, since you were the one that pulled it, Mr. Arp, 6.04 for discussion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, if it would please the council, I'd like to have the manager or the staff member. Madam Attorney. I'm sorry, Mayor. Um, did we not have a public forum this evening? Oh, you know what? I apologize for that. I'm all over the board. Yes, so we'll move to the public forum before we even get to the consent. So, uh, the public forum is a time that uh, Fayetteville residents may have input and a voice in what goes on in the city. Due to policy restrictions, the forum will last no longer than 30 minutes, and each speaker will be limited to three minutes to address the city council on related city issues. Individuals wishing to speak at tonight's public forum should have already signed up with the city clerk prior to the start of tonight's meeting. If you're here to speak on an item that may be on tonight's agenda under the public hearing, we ask that you reserve your comments until the public hearing. So when you hear your name called by the city clerk, we ask that you come to the podium and clearly state your name and home address for the record. 
Then when you see the light located on the podium change from green to yellow, you will have 30 seconds left to speak. When you see the red light come on, your time has expired. And again, due to policy restrictions, we're unable to extend that time. So with that being said, Madam Clerk. May we have two speakers for public forum this evening? The first speaker is Mr. Kemp Burdett. Welcome, Mr. Burdett. Thank you. Uh, thank you for letting me come and uh, address the council. My name is Kemp Burdett. I'm the Cape Fear Riverkeeper. Uh, my address is actually in Wilmington. Um, the organization I work for's mission is to protect and improve the water quality in the Cape Fear River. Uh, and could, I represent. Could you state your address, please? Uh, 116 Keaton Avenue, Wilmington. Thank you. Uh, we have nearly 1,000 members throughout the Cape Fear watershed. Um, some of whom are here. Uh, we work on issues throughout the watershed related to water quality and we are and I am especially concerned about the Sanderson Farms uh, proposed slaughterhouse on the Cape Fear River uh, and, and it's especially troubling because of its impact on water quality throughout the basin. Uh, of course the impacts from the facility spray field would be significant. Um, nearly 1.25 million chickens slaughtered a week would have the, the waste from that process sprayed on fields adjacent to the river. But the impacts from the nearly 600 new uh, chicken barns, factory style chicken barns that would be um, built to support that slaughterhouse are even more troubling. Uh, and we all know that, that this project would have major impacts, but I don't feel like you have all of the information you need to make a wise decision here. Um, and because it's because that information has not been provided to you. When Sanderson proposed a nearly identical project in Nash County, um, they were required to complete a complete environmental impact statement. Uh, and when the results of that environmental impact statement were in uh, Nash County and the city of Wilson, uh, realized that the proposal was bad news for their community's quality of life and their community's environment uh, and economy, uh, drinking water. And I feel like you should have that same information before you make decisions about uh, this project. Uh, you should demand that Sanderson Farm provide you with a full environmental impact statement so that you get the same information other communities have had when they rejected this proposal. Uh, and of course, you know you have a responsibility to your constituents here, but I'd also uh, kind of suggest that you have a responsibility to people who live downstream. Uh, nearly 300,000 of whom get their drinking water from the Cape Fear River below uh, this proposed facility and below uh, many of the of the chicken barns that would be uh, built to support it. Uh, in August of this year, there was a blue-green algal bloom that developed on the Cape Fear River uh, above Lock and Dam Number 1, above our drinking water supply in Wilmington and Brunswick County and much of Bladen County. This algal bloom was fueled by animal waste produced on chicken barns and chicken farms just like would be um, developed here. So I urge you to ask for a complete environmental impact statement. I urge you to consider not only the, the quality of life for your constituents here, but also for the people downstream who will be directly impacted uh, by this project. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burdett. <laughs> Madam Clerk. Mayor, our next speaker is Mr. Jerry Reinhold. Hello, Mr. Reinhold. Mr. Mayor, distinguished members of the City Council, my name is Jerry Reinhold, 516 Deer Path Drive, Fayetteville, North Carolina. Uh, my red shirt actually represents, you know, republicanism and red, you know, economic growth and opportunity and uh, and and good values for uh, for everybody. But what I'm here to call, talk about this evening is this morning, if you listen to uh, Jim and Goldie, you heard a call from a guy by the name of Jerry, asked Dr. Till about the, uh, the opportunity or the possibility of establishing a vocational high school in Cumberland County. And um, I know uh, Councilman Crisp uh, campaigned on that last year, and during your strategic summit that you had uh, this spring, it sort of uh, fell by the wayside. Uh, perhaps that's an issue that may be brought up next year as a as a goal. Obviously, the part of the concern that we have, I think all of us, that we want to have young young children uh, have the opportunity to develop skills to uh, become pr productive members of our society and our communities. You look at the population of the county 
detention center, the you know, two blocks away here, about 700 inmates. Most of them are in their 20s, both black, white, all minorities, and, uh, and you look at that, that uh, population, and those are high school dropouts or people with basically uh, no future. They didn't, uh, they didn't perhaps have the opportunities when they were youngsters to, uh, to, get, a, to get a start. And so what I'm proposing is that uh, to generate some interest and maybe follow the uh, model that Wake County set up last year, and this year they opened their own vocational high school. And the objective is to uh, provide career and technical education as opposed to purely a school book. And um, we need to uh, provide our children who are not going to go to college uh, with some uh, opportunities to take and uh, uh, perhaps develop manual skills. And some of the areas that they're the Wake County School is, is working on are plumbing, electrical, beauticians, construction, auto repair, um, nursing assistance, and then uh, other areas. I know Dr. Till's concern this morning on the radio was that there are already about 3,000 Fayetteville uh, High School or Cumberland County High School students that take advantage of FTCC. But there again, those are the those are the those are the students that really are not the problem that we need to deal with here. We got, we got problems, you know, with the dropouts and everything that I think uh, uh, we need to have an additional focus. And with the declining uh, population of the, st the student population, there's going to become available uh, additional uh, uh, school facilities that are potentially become available to act as a nucleus of, uh, of this project. And so, I'll closing, I just uh, ask that, you know, when you have your strategic summit in the springtime, that perhaps you, uh, you know, you put vocational high school on the, uh, on the agenda as something to consider, and I'll be, you know, socializing it more. Thank you. May we have no further speakers? All right, so we'll close the, uh, close the public forum. And in doing so, I'd like to recognize former Fayetteville City Councilwoman Mabel Smith is here with us. Welcome back, Ms. Smith. I thought that you may have, uh, may have signed up to speak, so that's why I didn't recognize you earlier. Thank you. Now speaking <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Council will move to item 6.0, which is the consent agenda. Mr. Mayor, um, as we identified in the approval of the agenda, there was uh, some interest among council members to have item 6.04 pulled from the consent agenda for discussion this evening. Okay. If we could have staff uh, represent that item. Okay, so council, we've got, got a motion. Is there a second? Second by Mr. Wright for the approval of uh, the consent with the exception of 6.04 which will be pulled for a separate vote. So let's go ahead and vote on consent. Uh, and we'll take discussion on the motion. Seeing none, thank you. <laughs> now I'll ask for your vote. Ms. Davey? Green. Thank you. That's unanimous, Madam Clerk. Ms. Smith, item 6.04, which is the contract for uh, audit Okay. Um, what we're doing is proposing that the city uh, engage Cherry Beckert, which is a local firm. Well, they have a local presence and so deemed as a local firm to have the city contract with them for the 2015 audit uh, period. Uh, the contract proposed is for $108,000. The proposed split between the general fund is about $64,800, and then that would leave the balance to be paid by the city's utility funds, electric water and wastewater, of $43,200. Uh, that represents uh, slightly less than 2% over fiscal year 14, and actually $14,720 less than the fee was in fiscal year 2009. Did that answer the questions, Council? Mr. Colvin. So, Ms. Smith, um, thank you. Thank you for that presentation. So, um, as we talked about in the, in the closed session, um, there, is a, there is an intent at some point, um, uh, a dinner session, P pardon me, dinner session, <coughs> um, there's an intent that, that this, these services will be uh, rendered out for bid 
Yes, we'd actually contemplated it for fiscal year 15, but with all the transition underway with our budget office and internal audit office, because we're having to uh, obtain new staff members in as our existing staff members get dispersed among all three functions, uh, what we're proposing is that we, instead of 15, do that for fiscal year 16. Uh, and I'd also comment that with the creation in the next few months of an uh, audit committee, that may be something that the audit committee would do as one of its charges would be to the selection of an audit firm for future fiscal periods. Okay. And when's the last time this contract for service was bid out? Uh, as I shared with you at the meeting, I believe it was somewhere in the neighborhood of around 2006. 2006. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Council, is there a motion? Mr. Mayor, I'd move that we approved item 6.04 to contract with Cherry Beckert Holland to audit accounts for FY 2014 and 2015. Second. Who is the second? Mr. McDougal, second. Council, discussion on the motion. Seeing none, I'll ask for your vote, please. Okay, that would be Madam Clerk 8 to 2. Sorry. Uh, Council <coughs> Members Crisp, Council Member Colvin voting against. Thank you. At this point, we'll move into the public hearings, which, if you're keeping track on your agenda, is uh, 7.012 and 3. Uh, individuals wishing to speak at a public hearing should have signed up with the city clerk prior to the start of tonight's meeting. Fifteen minutes will be allowed for each side of the issue being discussed. Each speaker will be limited to only three minutes unless your group wishes to appoint just one speaker. Time used in response to a question from council members will not be counted against you. Discussions following the public hearing will be limited to this body only unless I recognize you to answer or respond to a question. So when you hear your name called by the city clerk, we ask that you come to the podium and clearly state your name and home address for the record. Then when you see the light located on the podium change from green to yellow, you have 30 seconds left to speak. When you see the red light come on, your time has expired. And again, due to policy restrictions, we are unable to extend that time given. Madam Clerk. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Harmon. Yeah, the... the uh First case you have before you is P1443F, uh, it's a public hearing for a special use permit uh, to extend uh, parking on a private golf course. Um, since it is a special use permit, we do need to swear in all the speakers for that before we get started. May we have one speaker for this item, Mr. George Rose. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth? So help you God. I do. Thank you. <clears throat> Again, this property is located at 2237 Winter Locking Road. Uh, it is part of or adjacent to uh, Highland Golf Course uh, Country Club. Uh, just to give you an idea of where the property is located. Uh, Winter Lockin is this road uh, here to the north and east, uh, Rayford Road uh, here to the uh, west and north. Um, <clears throat> all of the property uh, kind of surrounding this area is SF10. Uh, private golf courses are allowed in single family uh, developments under a special use permit, and that's why. Uh, this one is before you tonight. Uh, the property you see highlighted is the property in question. Uh, it is adjacent to uh, the existing parking at Highland. Uh, and you'll see in a moment uh, the site plan where they wish to expand that uh, parking. Uh, currently, uh, low density residential, the house is actually may actually be moved by today. Uh, uh, over the weekend, I think I saw them taking it out. So um, you do have commercial as you come back uh, 
west on Rayford, and then more residential development uh, in the north area of Rayford. Uh, land use plan does call for the low density residential, which the SF10 that's there now is. Uh, photo of the home that uh, was on the property. Uh, just a different angle. This is from Winter Locking. Uh, and then this is from out at Rayford Road. Um, it's here behind the trees. Um, the engineer for this uh, project is working with the city. Uh, on an alternative landscape plan uh, to attempt to save most of these trees that uh, border Rayford and Winterlochen uh, so that the, the visual impact, although it will be parking on the other side, will not be really any different than what's there currently. Um, again, uh, your picture on the left is what's uh, existing with the, ho or the house that uh, has been taken out. Uh, this is what they're looking to do, uh, additional parking, uh, as I said, at that intersection, which is adjacent to the parking that they already have. And that's the only uh, residential lot uh, used for residential, uh, kind of in that little block where the uh, actual country club is. Uh, conditions of approval, uh, the attached site plan that we just looked at, uh, approval of the TRC of, the, of that site plan and alternative landscaping plan. Um, zoning Commission and staff have both recommend approval. That's based on the properties adjacent to the main entrance uh, and existing parking of the club. Properties located at an intersection that separates it from the closest residential properties. Uh, TRC has already given preliminary site plan approval. And the submitted alternative uh, landscaping plan will help save the existing vegetation around the property. Any questions of staff before we open your public hearing? Mr. Crisp. Mr. Harmon, uh, as I'm looking at it, I'm understanding that if this is approved, access, access will be through the existing parking lot. Is that correct? Yes, sir. If you look on your screen there the uh, map you can see this is the entrance into Highland here so it is adjacent to the entrance there will be no new curb cuts on Winter Locking or Rayford Road for this. That's my answer. Thank you. That's my question. Thank you. Thank you Mr. Mayor. Thank you Mr. Chris. Any other? All right uh, we'll open our public hearing Madam Clerk. May we just have one speaker, Mr. George Rose. Welcome, Mr. Rose. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. I appreciate the opportunity to speak before you. I'm the engineer representing Highland Country Club, and uh, we went, as you've heard before the zoning commission, they unanimously approved this. Didn't have any uh, neighborhood opposition to it, and certainly we don't have any more tonight. And I think that's uh, the, the fact that when we put in this additional parking, it will relieve some overflow parking that typically happens on winter lock and in front of some of the residents. So, uh, frankly, I think the residents are glad to see this happen. Um, as uh, Craig stated, we have got a uh, alternative landscape plan to save the trees along winter lock and, and Rayford Road. So, really, it will screen the the parking very well. I think so. Be, be glad to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Rose. Council, any questions? All right, seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Go back to council. Mr. Art. Mr. Mayor, I would uh, move that the council approve the special use permit application as presented with the eight findings uh, of fact. Second. Second. Mr. Art, let's take Ms. Davy second. Is that all right? Absolutely. All right, Mr. Art, Ms. Davy. Thank you. Council, uh, discussion on the uh, on the motion? Seeing none, I'll ask for your vote, please. Green. And with Ms. Davies Green, that is unanimous, Madam Clerk. Mr. Hartman, 7.02. <clears throat> Whoops. 
The uh, next item we have before you tonight uh, is an item you've seen a couple of times at work sessions um, here over the summer and a month or so ago. Uh, this is uh, related to tobacco-oriented businesses. Um, as you're aware, uh, here uh, over a year ago, uh, our new police chief at the time uh, had asked us to look at uh, regulating tobacco-oriented businesses. Um, there was a issue with a lot of crime being committed at, at some of these businesses. And uh, at the same time, the city of Greenville, North Carolina, uh, had just enacted uh, a similar ordinance. Uh, and the police chief wanted us to take a look at that and see if that was something that uh, we could do here in the city of Fayetteville to help curb some of the, the crime that was occurring at these. Um, what you see uh, here, the, the magnitude of, of the issue um, over a two-year period uh, when police did uh, calls for service uh, for the uh, right around just a little over 60 uh, shops that were identified as tobacco businesses. Um, they accounted for about 13,000 calls for service in a two-year period. Um, and as you can see, kind of in the breakdown below, um, really not, not much uh, the calls for service and all from your uh, cigar bars, your hookah bars, even the Class 1 tobacco shops, um, mainly from the uh, Class 2 uh, tobacco shops in class threes. Um, as you can see, the lower number of class threes and class twos uh, magnifies the fact that, that they accounted for 58% of the, the service calls. Uh, just to give you an idea of where we're talking about, I know it's a little hard to see, uh, especially on the monitors up top, uh, but each of the little green squares uh, that you'll see on this map represent a tobacco shop. And then there's some other tobacco shops represented by these little pink stars, red or pink stars. And those are ones that uh, lie in the either the neighborhood, uh, either the neighborhood commercial districts or the downtown commercial district. So we'll, those are ones that uh, when this went before the planning commission, uh, as part of their recommendation, uh, they have recommended those be uh, amortized uh, within a three-year period. Um, and just this is a list of the ones that uh, fall into that. There are 10, uh, we believe, at this point. Uh, the two at the top with the stars, they did show up in our uh, top 10 of calls for services. Uh, the others did not. Uh, Looks like a lot are in District 2. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Is that good, Mr. Mayor? Um, and here are the ones uh, photoed. Uh, that you saw a moment ago, the uh, Food Mart. This is uh, the only one we have in the downtown district. Uh, this is uh, 2020 out on Murchison Road. Uh, this is uh, a TRO uh, in a neighborhood district. It's out on uh, Rose Hill Road. Um, this next couple, I believe, are around the uh, Cliffdale and Raleigh Road area. Um, and then this is out uh, <clears throat> at Cliffdale and Rim Road, I believe. Mm -hmm. And so is this. Uh, and then the, the la this one, the 365, is along uh, uh, Rayford Road across from one of our uh, uh, recreation centers. Uh, and then the last one that, that is in the list is uh, Tobacco Mart along Hope Mills Road. Oh, I'm sorry. There was one more. Uh, Corner Store, which is actually right uh, uh, 
Uh, and you'll see it here in the foreground is the new roundabout uh, on Southern Avenue. That's kind of this grassy area here. So if you've been around there, that's, that's where the corner store is. Um, issues, of course, have come up uh, during the uh, stage where we've taken it to the Planning Commission. Uh, we did hold three public hearings with the Planning Commission, plus a couple of other just regular meetings with them as well. Um, one thing that, uh, before I get into this list, I will say uh, an issue that had not come up until here very recently uh, were vapor stores. Uh, and in the current uh, version of the ordinance, they are included with class two tobacco shops. Um, staff is actually recommending tonight that those be taken out. Uh, and that's planning staff and the police. Uh, we've discussed it. There really isn't uh, uh, the statistical evidence of crime uh, that we see at, at some of the other tobacco shops that started this, uh, really to warrant having them as part of this ordinance. Um, again, just some of the issues and concerns that, that came about during the process, um, special use permits. Um, those uh, the Planning Commission recommended for all of the tobacco uses except for the Class 1 tobacco shops. Um, amortization uh, in the neighborhood commercial and downtown districts. Um, that was recommended as well. That would be a three-year uh, period for the owners, operators of the stores to either come into compliance uh, or in their business at that location. Uh, a lot of discussions on the, the options for stores affected by amortization. Uh, and again, those really come down to uh, the main things of either coming into compliance with the ordinance, uh, which probably means changing their business model a little bit, uh, you know, changing location, or coming before the city council to ask for a change of zoning. Uh, to get into a district that would allow that use. Uh, another concern of the uh, Planning Commission was the broad approach to the program. And what I will say to that is the one thing you have to remember is we're going at this through zoning. So there's only so much you can do through zoning um, to regulate these. But in order to regulate, we have to regulate by the different districts. So any, no matter how many stores are in any particular district, our neighborhood commercial, our limited commercial, or uh, those type of districts, um, no matter how many are in it, they are all treated the same. We can't pick and choose and uh, individualize uh, businesses through the zoning. Uh, it has to be a broad program. Um, there were some adjustments made uh, to the uses and spacing between them, a uh, little different than the, uh, we did start off using Greenville's ordinance a little bit as, a, uh, as, <clears throat> as our start to this process, but we did make some adjustments so that they more mirror uh, some of the distance qualifications that we have for other uses uh, in our own ordinance. Um, one of the things that came about uh, uh, through the public hearings and through the Planning Commission was regulation of hours of operation for Class 2 and 3 shops. Now, that would only be shops that are within 100 feet of a residence or a residential zoning district. But if they do come within 100 feet of that, they would have 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, business time. Um, that's been one of the, one of the big concerns that, that came out of this uh, from police was that especially these uh, operations that are right on the fringe of residential areas, when there is crime that occurs, uh, either the crime 
goes into the residential area or that's where the people disperse into the residential area uh, when the police get there. And so there, there are reasons for trying to, to curb, uh, and a lot of the crime actually occurs very late at night at some of these. So that's another reason for the uh, hours of operation. Um, they also took a look at the signage uh, issue in the definition section that was tweaked a little bit so that uh, any store that just had, uh, you know, their own little Marlboro sign in the window uh, didn't necessarily all, all of a sudden make them a tobacco shop. Um, and then uh, one of the other uh, spacing requirements we did change was between uh, hookah cafes and themselves. Uh, we, it originally started out from the Greenville Ordinance at a, about a half mile, and we brought it down to 500 feet, which matches uh, what, we would, what the ordinance requires for cigar bars. Um, and just a little, because I know the amortization question is a, a big hot button issue, just wanted to give you a b brief background, um, especially for council members that have not been on council for a while, but um, back in 2009, uh, we started an amortization process for salvage yards in the city. Um, and at that point, um, the junkyards, salvage yards that were determined to be non-conforming as of January 1, of 09 were subject to these uh, standards below. Uh, by January 2010, uh, they had to start shrinking back uh, their operation. By 11, uh, they had to shrink back more. And then by January 1 of 2012, if they still had not come into compliance with their UDO, then they had to go out of business. Um, these are the salvage yards as they started out in, uh, at that January 1, 2009 uh, date as nonconforming. Uh, we had three that came in to city council and were able to get rezoned uh, to stay in business. Uh, we had two that completely shut down. And then we had uh, several, uh, you see at the bottom of the list, that uh, were businesses that the salvage portion was not the only thing they did. They were uh, auto repair or they were some other business as well and they were able to close the uh, junk or salvage portion of their business um, but uh, remain, uh, remain with the uh, main part of their business still open. <clears throat> Um, again, the commission and staff have recommended that council uh, move to adopt the proposed tobacco oriented business ordinance uh, as presented by staff and find that it's consistent between this request and the city's comprehensive plan and supporting documents as recommended by staff. Any questions of staff before you open the public hearing? Yes, Mr. Hurst. Just a quick question for information, Mr. Harmon. Of the 60-plus tobacco shops, um, you had mentioned the, uh, the pink stars, which even with my glasses, I can barely see them. Here, here are the names. Oh, of the that's the names stars. of them. Okay. Um, <coughs> these are the ones that you have starred for amortization. But you had mentioned something about uh, of the three criteria, one would be change their business model. Is that – but you said somewhat – so well, they, just a little bit of tweaking. Yeah. Does that come from the Green, Greenville Ordinance? Is, is no, that specified in there? What changes the business model they'd have to do to come into compliance? What they have to do to come into compliance is, is meet our ordinance. Right now, say if you're a uh, Class two tobacco shop um, and you've got – find that real <clears throat> If you're a Class two tobacco shop and you've got – you know, twenty percent of your retail space devoted to cigarette sales, and that puts you over the hump and gets you into being a class two tobacco shop. Um, what it may mean is that you uh, find some way, some other 
something other to do, you know, some uh, some other retail to do in your store, or some way to get yourself below that 20% of your re retail space. For some, it may be that they're under the retail space, but their signage pulls them into the, the ordinance, and they may have to uh, change their signage on their building, and that may get them under the ordinance as well. Okay, Mr. Colvin. Uh, Mr. Harmon, so <coughs> just to, to help help me understand this, um, what constitutes a cigar parlor or a hookah bar? It, so, so in other words, if a one of these locations added a patio for smoking, is it now a cigar parlor or a hookah bar? No, no, sir. No, there's um, the definitions. Uh, within the ordinance uh, what you have uh, say for a hookah cafe it's an establishment that is their primary uh, or accessory use uh, provides on-site consumption uh, of hookah pipes okay what makes a cigar bar um, the cigar bars is an establishment that sells and caters to patrons who smoke cigars and where smoking is allowed indoors. Uh, the establishments may include uh, limited consumption of alcohol as well as long as it goes uh, as it fits with our other ordinances. Okay. Mainly it's it's the indoor consumption of, of the tobacco products or what kind of separates those. And typically, the places that have the indoor consumption don't have the crowd. Okay. All right. Thank you. Seeing no further questions, we'll open the public hearing. Madam Clerk. May we have six speakers in opposition for this item. The first one is Ms. Jonah DeRosia. And while she's headed up here, I just want to remind you that you have 15 minutes total. So... You've got three minutes individually, but only 15 total, so you might not want to take your whole time so everybody can speak. Great. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, my name is Jonna DeRosier. My address is 5141 Hummingbird Place, Fayetteville, 28312. Um, uh, my husband, Mike, and I, we own J&M Vapor at 318 Hay Street, and I'm speaking on behalf of myself and some of the others that are here. Um, Fine looking crowd. <laughs> uh, so I'm here, I'm here tonight to voice my opinion on the ordinance you're looking to pass that would ban my vape shop from the downtown area and put several of the other local vape shops in jeopardy of shutting down. Uh, my husband and I were former smokers and we've smoked over 30 years and over the years we've tried you know, numerous things. We've tried acupuncture, hypnosis, pills, patch, you know, you name it, we've tried. Um, and it wasn't until we bought a vapor starter kit uh, that we were able to finally quit smoking. And that's the reason that we decided to open a store is because, you know, it, it really worked and we wanted to help others do the same. Uh, if you guys have ever known anybody that struggled with trying to quit smoking, um, you know, you would, you would know what I'm saying. It's, you know, it's kind of rough. Um, you know, you have our vape shops classified as tobacco stores, and, you know, we don't, we don't sell tobacco. I don't sell tobacco. I, I don't even sell, you know, Bic lighters. Um, I have, you know, a vape store. I sell vaping supplies. Um, we want to help people quit smoking, you know, not start or to continue to smoke. Um, the liquid that's used in the vapor pens, they contain four ingredients, you know, five if you include nicotine. Uh, it's water, vegetable glycerin, food grade propylene glycol, and flavoring. And, you know, all these ingredients have been improved individually by the FDA. Um, I can understand you not wanting traditional tobacco stores downtown or within 500 feet of a school, considering most tobacco stores, they sell the single cigarettes, glass pipes, and beer. Um, I can promise you, if you go into any vape store, you'll never see cigarettes being sold, uh, or glass pipes, or beer. Um, we don't have questionable characters loitering outside. Um, our customers have one common goal, and that's to uh, not smoke and to encourage others to do the same. 
Uh, what makes this ordinance even worse is that you're given the okay for, you know, cigar bars and hookah lounges uh, to be near schools in the downtown area, but not vape shops. Uh, that, in my mind, is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Um, before you make your decision, I encourage each of you to visit a vape shop and you'll see that we're a community of sorts. You'll find the customers in the store will offer you more support and encouragement uh, if you're looking to quit smoking. Um, we care about our community. Recently, Murray's Auto, with donations from other local vape stores, um, they held a Cars and Clouds event to raise money and can or raise canned foods for the uh, Second Harvest Bank. Am I out of time? You are out of time. Okay. Sorry about that. It's okay. Thank you. Mayor, our next speaker is Mr. Themi Kola. Okay. And while you're headed up, I'd like to remind everybody that the vapor uh, vape stores have been omitted now from the uh, from the proposal. Thank you, Mayor, members of the Council, for hearing me. My name is Thamie Kohler. I live at 322nd Street, Stedman, North Carolina. Um, I'd just like to start by saying I think I understand what the city is trying to accomplish with the proposed ordinance. Um, I don't disagree with the determination that there is a problem and there's a need to address it. What I disagree with is the conclusion that tobacco outlets are a problem. If you'll notice that the picture that was shown, a lot of them are fast food marts. Um, and I would think that they may not even qualify under the 20% rule as it's written. Um, this first point of contention that tobacco, prob tobacco outlets are the nuisance, if so, we have to ask what the nuisance, what about the tobacco outlet is causing the problem. If you go based off on the way the legislation is proposed, it's we're simply overstocked. We've got too much tobacco in the store. Now, how reducing tobacco in the store is going to solve a crime problem, I don't understand. Uh, the original legislation text, as I understand it, addressed the 13,000 crime calls to the stores and that 10 of those stores were responsible for 50% of the calls. Of those 10, this legislation only closes two of the stores down. Um, I'm a regional manager for TRO, the one on Rose Hill Road is this is one of the stores that would be amortized during the same period that we had 13,000 calls we called three times but yet you're still going to close my store and throw it in with the nuisance problem um, and that's one of the that's one of the issues we we have we take point with um, our set he was talking about coming into compliance while we think we are a true tobacco outlet about 85 percent of our product is tobacco like the other lady said, we don't sell beer, we don't carry glass pipes in federal, we don't sell t-shirts, we don't sell, we are a true tobacco. You can come in and buy chewing tobacco, dry snuff, moist snuff, cigars, we have walk-in humidor, we have accessories that go along with it, lighter, cigarette cases, those kind of items, but we don't carry beer and stuff like that. To come into compliance, like Mr. Harmon was saying, basically what you're telling these stores that are out there is take out eight foot of tobacco and put in four coolers or 40 ounce beer and you'll be okay. Now do you really think, do you really think adding more beer in place of cigarettes is going to be what takes us into it? If you go to the last point, <clears throat> if you go to the analysis, it says that provide seven standards of review for the proposed text. I'd like to call your attention number four whether in the extent to which the proposed amendment addresses a demonstrated need. Again, back to the 13,000. If you're only call, closing two of the 10 that causes 50%, does the legislation really address the problem? I don't think so. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Mayor, our next speaker is Mr. Chad Whitaker. Hello, uh, Chad Whitaker, 589 River Birch Drive, Vass, North Carolina. Thank you for letting me uh, speak tonight. Um, I'm vice president and owner of TRO, 
we are one of the stores that you're looking to amortize out. I would like to say, you know, we would like to keep the doors open. We've had that store since 1999. <clears throat> We are not part of the problem that you know, you're looking to alleviate here in Fayetteville. We understand that there is a problem. This legislation, I believe, is going about it in the wrong way. As Mr. Carler said, all they've got to do is redo their product mix. Most of them are convenience stores. If you walk inside of them, they've got coolers of beers, chips, crackers. You're not going to be able to shut down a kangaroo. You're not going to be able to shut them down under this ordinance if all they do is change a sign. So thank you and appreciate the time. Thank you, sir. Mayor, our next speaker is Mr. Ben Amstead. How's it going? My name is Ben Amstead. I live at 3456 Sugarcane Circle, 28303. Um, I'm here to represent uh, my family's company, which is Anstead's Tobacco. We're up on McPherson Church Road. Uh, we've been in the premium cigar business for about 35 years here in Fayetteville. Um, and pretty much here to echo a lot of the same points uh, the gentleman from TRO and some of the other folks have said, that um, we believe that this ordinance is a little bit misguided and fraught with the potential for some unintended consequences. Uh, we, being a premium cigar shop, understand the intent of what you guys are trying to accomplish with this legislation. Um, but uh, it's got a lot of potential to kind of snag a lot of people who aren't really in particularly doing anything wrong. We're a class one. We're thankful that the uh, writers of this um, have made these different types of uh, distinctions between the way that these stores operate. Um, but you can expect that all these folks who are running these illegitimate shops um, are going to make just the tiny tweaks that they need to to get away from uh, what this legislation is trying to stop. I mean, Mr. Harmon mentioned that in some cases, people can only simply change a sign um, and that uh, they would fall into compliance with the ordinance. Well, how does just changing a sign stop any crime from actually happening in one of those places? It doesn't. It doesn't solve the problem. So um, it's purely by the nature of the unintended consequences, the fact that this is not a very uh, business-friendly um, ordinance that uh, has been proposed. Um, we just like to be on the record as being against it, and we think it's bad for business and it's bad for Fayetteville. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor, our next speaker is Mr. David Curry. Good evening, members of council. Good evening. My name is David Curry. Um, I, along my law firm, Bieber Curry Law Firm, represent a number of convenience stores and businesses that may fall are likely to fall under this ordinance, some of which may even uh, be included in some of the businesses um, uh, referenced tonight by the speakers who made several very good points. I want to make this point um, to the council. The several businesses that I represent that were on the list tonight um, are property owners, business owners in this community. They have invested in this community. They pay property taxes in this community. They make money when crime is not committed in their parking lot. They make money when issues do not arise in their parking lot. There is no way they do not sell more chips, they do not sell more cigarettes, they do not sell more anything when the law is being violated in the parking lot, in the street in front of their parking lot, or in the neighborhood surrounding their parking lot. There aren't many businesses that do. There is a willingness of these businesses, instead of uh, amateurization, a, a, a polite way of saying shutting your business down, um, there is a willingness by these businesses to get to the real core of the issue seeking to be addressed by this council through this ordinance. Because I, I believe, and I believe they believe, that as those issues are addressed, it will serve to do nothing but increase property values, property, properties they own, and increase business, improve clientele, and reduce the number of headaches that do not lend themselves to the, the growth of their business. I would also ask when the city is, um, when, when staff or, or uh, various committees are presenting information to this council, to take note of the fact of CAD calls. Many of these businesses are in lower income areas 
which have their own bag of issues to deal with anyhow. And so any business seeking and trying to do business in that area is going to have to confront and try to deal with as best it can some of the issues that are already there. I met with a business owner today that has installed over the last 48 hours over 40 cameras in and outside the business, one of the businesses on that list. That is for uh, his own uh, protection, be it for a claim of something that didn't occur, but to show how things were going on inside the business, to show that loitering is not occurring outside the business, and then to take recognition of the fact as it relates to the location, not just from a socio-economic uh, standpoint, but also from a geographic standpoint, when you put a business like this on a corner where there's traffic coming from every direction, every single car wreck, every domestic violence that started five blocks away is going to end up using that business as a point of reference to call 911, and that happens. I've seen it time and time again in dealing with issues like this. I would ask this council to consider pulling this matter. Um, we've already addressed the vapor thing and, and addressing our clients and knowing we're willing to reach out and help solve the actual problem not what this ordinance does. Thank you, Mr. Kerr. Thank you. Now our final speaker is Mr. Dan Dipple. My name is Dan Dipple, uh, 4717 Yadkin Road, uh, 28303. Um, I originally came up here to argue against this proposal regarding the vapor stores. I'm the district manager of ElectroVapor. We have three stores here in Fayetteville, our third one um, just being launched this week um, and bringing jobs to the area. And I wanted to come up and say thank you for striking it from this ordinance. Um, you can see the kind of support that we can garner um, and that, that, we can, that we have as a community. And I wanted to bring that to y'all's attention. Excuse me. Um, it is a community that is involved in vaping and it's something that we banded together to do and I'd like to ask for your continued support as far as we as a community are represented. Um, we are a large community. We get together and we have events and we we bond with each other in a way that very few communities can nowadays and I would very much appreciate your continued support excuse me in that matter. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> No, we have no further speakers. All right. Uh, any questions from council? Mr. Colvin. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I had a question for Attorney Curry, I believe. Uh, Mr. Curry, come back up to the podium for a minute, please. Yes, sir. Mr. Curry, I, uh, I missed part of what you said, but I, I, I caught the gist of it. And, uh, I mean, as you know, uh, certainly – uh, last thing that I want to do, and I think a lot of this council is to impede business growth. But you you understand that 13,000 calls in two two years is not a sustainable number for for the police chief and, and his and his force. Absolutely. So, you know, I, I think the one part you hit on uh, was that if you do business in these areas, uh, you know, sometimes it's the area that leads to the problem versus the business. You know, now I, my business is in one of these hot spots, and so I kind of, kind of disagree somewhat with that because I mean you've got some very fine businesses, barber shops, and restaurants, and dry cleaners that don't have five or six calls a thousand calls a month. But I would personally, I guess, like to maybe see a delayed action on this until we can kind of resolve it because I, I think you know I would hope that it's your client's intention to to be to be good partners in the community versus bad because. You know, we do have a problem, I'm speaking for my community, uh, have a serious problem with, with this detracting away from our community. So Yes, sir. Right. And if I may, I agree. I think you make a very valid point. And as to my remark um, briefly as to the, uh, uh, the, com as to, as to the community, um, I, I think what you have, especially when certain um, demographics, when you're dealing with a lot of uh, foot traffic, with folks that may or may not have ready access to uh, automobile traffic uh, or automobiles and uh, transportation, they can't drive wherever they want. They go to their nearby store. They get there how they can as quickly as they can. Um, and I, I think what we're dealing with there is to a community that needs somewhere to go. They need a, the right place to go. They need a safe place to go. And I think with improved communication between these stores to find out and come and understand with the city council and its committees and, and law enforcement, what is, what is your understanding of the actual problem, the, the root problem, and what can we do as store owners 
to resolve the actual problem, not go up and down on volumes of tobacco in a store and things of that nature. And they stand ready to do that. And if, if tabling the matter or pulling the matter and allowing further conversations to really come at the issue and, and to do an outreach to get that effort on behalf of these stores to actively participate in the solution instead of fighting the ordinance, I, I, that seems like the, the, the better way. Thank you, Great. sir. Thank you. I would encourage you to be the advocate of that, Mr. Curry. I will continue to do so. Mr. Meade uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd, I'd um, like to move that we table this one issue until our January work session, but I'd also like to invite these participants tonight to work along with Mr. Harmon and us in our work session. You know, that way it's not a one sided ordinance. I don't know if any of them have been working with him. Or at least at least for them to have some representation, we probably can't get them all in the session, but for them to pick and choose maybe three or four people to uh, to sit down and to work with us. So the motion is to postpone until the January work session? Yes, sir. And, so mayor, I second that. And ask for input from the... Three or four representatives from that group. Uh, from that group. Can work with Mr. Harmon. Yes, sir. Okay. And we can't control the second part of that, but I yeah, got your motion. Attorney, if, and, and especially anybody that represents that area, 2012 Murgerson Road, which I promised in my campaign that I would clean up. Okay. We have a Who, we have who a store is that? 2020. 20, is it 2012? 2020? Oh, it's called 2020. I just know it's at 2112 Murgerson Road. Now. Okay. Thank you, Mr. McDougal. We have a motion. We have a second by Mr. Wright. I've got some other lights, Mr. Uh, Mr. Art. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and thank you, Mr. McDougal, for the, uh, the oh, Mr. Mullen, sir. Oh, okay. You don't have a green light, but you're all right. <laughs> Ms. Davey, did you have a question? Yes, I would just like to, if it's okay, to um, friendly amendment to add on to um, um, Council Member McDougal's motion to also have at this discussion some of our Community Watch representatives. Um, I'm pretty sure we can all think of a couple of Community Watches in our area that constantly get these calls for services and they're talking to their crime prevention specialists saying, what can we do as a community? Um, the, store owners, the store owners of these facilities are not coming to the Community Watch meetings. It'd be nice to see them present at some of these Community Watch meetings so they can work together. And as we said, we could try to bring this back um, to make a better solution with the ordinance. Okay. I'll accept that, Mr. Mayor. Yes, I'll accept right, accepted Mr. by the yes. primary motion maker and the second. Any other discussion, Mr. Arp? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And as, as I was saying, thank you, Mr. McDougal, for the motion to, to table this to our January work session. Um, I think all are in agreement. This needs much more work so we don't have unintended consequences. So thank you. Seeing no further discussion, Council, I'll ask for your vote, which is to delay. Green. And with Ms. Davey, that's unanimous. Thank you. <clears throat> Council, we'll take a five minute break. I need some heat, man. I'm cold up in here.
Senate Council. Disconnected from Katie, but she, yeah, she called me to get put back up, and I said, "Call Ted." She just has to call into his number like she did last. Time. And she, yeah, and she must be on. Call Angus. Now she's going to try to call back. We'll vote for you too. We'll vote. <laughs> yeah, in that little room, do they? Unless you do it on the phone and do it on speakerphone. Ask here. <coughs> yeah. No. Boy, that brings back memories of that damn boy. <laughs> All right, item 7.03 is the phase five annexation for areas 12 and 13. And uh, Mr. Trago. Mr. Brown. Ms. Brown. <laughs> That's Thank okay. you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Members of Council, uh, I'm here this evening before you open the public hearing on the, annex the assessment for Phase 5 annexation for 12 and 13, just to give you some background on the project so you have some general information. Um, this area is um, the Aaron Lakes West and Shenandoah to Shenandoah North area, which I'll show you a map in a second. It's uh, south of Rafer Road between um, uh, uh, east of Bingham and then off of Bailey, Le Bailey Lake Road, south of Bailey Lake Road. Uh, it's in Councilman um, Crisp's district. Um, okay. This total project cost was $6.3 million. And there were 412 parcels. That's an average of about $15,400 per parcel. And as, uh, just as a reminder, the way the properties have been assessed, single-family residential properties are assessed $5,000. If it's a non-single-family property, it's assessed at the same per foot rate as $5,000 at $55.56 with a 90-foot minimum. And those properties are also charged an average cost of the lateral of $1,563 per lateral. There are five of the 412 properties that are non-family, single-family residential, so it's largely single-family residential. Um, payment options are available to the citizens who are assessed. Uh, financing is available for up to 10 years. The interest rate of 5.25 percent is the rate that was set by Council last January, um, was reviewed in July by Council policy and determined it was still 5.25 percent. All right, and the customer and citizens can finance that over 10 years in either monthly or annual payments. Some important dates uh, for, the, for the assessment role. Uh, at your January 12th regular meeting, uh, you'll have a resolution before you to confirm the assessment role and levy the assessments, including that is setting what the interest rate would be for that. On January 21st, we'll issue the notice of assessment to the property owners. On February 2nd, we'll publish a new paper, newspaper notice of the assessment. And with that, I'm available for any questions. Any questions from council? Ah, uh, yes. How did Mr. Chris get his area done before me? <laughs> <laughs> Start, it started five, or I guess it was about five years ago. It, that's the priority was set, and we're still on that schedule. <laughs> Simplified answer is I got here before he did. That, that's exactly. You were, five years ago, you he was here and you weren't. <laughs> All right. All right. Any other questions? Seeing none. Madam Clerk. So we have no speakers for the public hearing. We'll open and close the public hearing. Council, I'll go to you for action, please. Any action being taken on item point 703? Mr. Moan. Mr. Mayor, based on the presentation, tonight was in a public hearing for citizens to speak should they want to speak and then you know no decision was being made tonight to you know, uh, assess the personnel but that would come back at our uh, January 
12th meeting, I believe you said, for right, actual, it's, that's, it's that's when the agenda vote. for your January 12th meeting. Okay. We have to submit it, but that's the plan. Right. And um, during our break, uh, I talked to a gentleman in the hallway, and he was wondering if this item what, what is coming up today, and he's in the audience, and uh, obviously he didn't sign up, but... Um, Mr. Mayor, I'm available to answer any citizen questions after the after you're done here. I'll go out and I'll answer any questions anybody has. Thank you, Mr. Ray. No, no. Okay, then um, make a motion that we accept the report tonight and that this comes back to our January 12th meeting for an actual vote. Second, Mr. Mayor. Have a motion and a second. Is there discussion on the motion, please, Council? All right, seeing none, I'll ask for your vote. Mayor Pro Tem. Green. Green. <laughs> And that, Madam Clerk, is unanimous from those members here. Thank you. Well, it's unanimous because... She's out She's not here, so just Moving to items of other business, and that is the renewal of the agreement with the uh, Economic Development Services of the Chamber, known to us as the Alliance 8.01. Like to recognize Mr. John Mitchell for being here. Mr. Mitchell, it's always a pleasure to see you. That's Curly. That's Curly. Where you John Mitchell from? Not the real man. <laughs> Welcome, Miss Small Tony. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, and members of council. Uh, before you is a um, MOA that uh, we've talked about before in uh, previous work sessions, but I'll uh, very quickly sort of go over it um, so that you'll know uh, what this is about. Uh, this is an MOA that establishes a six-month renewal for the North Carolina Alliance for Certain Economic Development Services. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Hurst. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as much as I would love to hear your presentation, Ms. Smalltone, I, um, I would like to make a motion, if there's no questions, Mr. Mayor, to approve the agreement between the City of Fayetteville and the Fayetteville Cumberland County Chamber of Commerce for Economic Development Service for the remainder of fiscal year 2015. Second, second. Mr. Mayor. It's a uh, motion, Mr. Hur, second by Mr. Arp. Is there uh, any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, Castle asks for your vote. Mayor Pro Tem. <laughs> That's unanimous, Madam Clerk. Thank you. Thank you. 8.02 is the presentation for the comprehensive annual financial report. Welcome, Ms. Smith. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, members of council. At the December 1 work session that you held, we had a full presentation of the audit results and the comprehensive annual financial report for the fiscal year ended June 30, 2014. At that time, Michelle Thompson, who is a partner with Cherry Beckert, made a presentation of the audit results, um, and we provided additional information. At your request tonight, we are providing a, an abbreviated presentation for the uh, viewing audience. If somebody would like more information on this, where would they go to find it? Uh, actually, the financial report, if it's not already, will be available on the city's website in the finance section of the city's website. The full report? The full report, yes, sir. Can we, can we make sure on the home page we have a jump off link to that so they don't have to dig to find it? Uh, we'll certainly work with the web personnel to do that. And if if you wish, I can uh, proceed with the results of the financial audit. As I mentioned, uh, Ms. Thompson did uh, present the audit results to you at that time. Uh, just to summarize again, um, the city did have an unmodified audit opinion for the fiscal year 2014. And for anyone not familiar with that terminology, that represents the highest level of assurance a CPA can provide. So we had an excellent audit opinion. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we had no audit adjustments or material weaknesses as a uh, CPA would define for that purpose. However, there were two significant deficiencies notated in the audit report related to the uh, Oracle project implemented by the city's utility for the electric water and wastewater system projects. Um, and we'll talk about that 
in a moment in terms of how we'll request that they report back to you on resolving those issues. But there were two significant deficiencies identified with the implementation of that project. Uh, the city did administer successfully $22.4 million of federal and state grant programs with no question costs, so that was certainly a success for the fiscal year. So that concluded basically the, uh, the audit results themselves. Now just to turn our attention to some uh, operating data. Uh, the audit report itself contains information on all of the city's funds. That would be the general fund, the electric, water, wastewater utility funds, and the other enterprise funds and other funds of the city for capital projects, uh, as it were. Uh, what we'll focus on this evening is for the principal fund of the city, which is the general fund where most of the mu general municipal services reside. Um, and as you can see uh, in the uh, PowerPoint presentation before you, the general fund operating results can be found on page E5 of the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report that will be available on the city's website. Um, to summarize the information on the slide, we began with the row revenues and other financing sources. As we mentioned at our meeting, um, revenues is what you would expect in terms of property taxes, sales taxes, and those types of revenues. Other financing sources would be items such as transfers from our utility, as well as any fund balance appropriation. We've rolled that information up in this particular slide and shown you the original budget, the final budget that existed at June 30, 2014. The third numerical column represents the actual results in terms of revenues uh, received or other financing sources received by the city. And then in the final column, you see the final budget to actual variance. Um, and so you can see that our revenues uh, that were budgeted at June 30 in the second column represented $155.1 million. Our actual revenues generated were uh, just under $149 million, representing a um, negative budget variance of $6.1 million. Um, I would not be concerned with the negative budget variance because that essentially represents the amount of fund balance that was appropriated to balance the budget, and we discussed that in detail at the December 1 work session. In terms of the expenditures and other financing uses, um, expenditures are primarily for police, fire, transportation, recreation, and other general fund supported activities um, to the extent that the general fund provided support for solid waste, transit, among other items that are included in the general fund. Um, other financing uses would also include transfers to our utility fund for uh, annexation improvements as it relates to the extension of water and sewer in the areas annexed primarily uh, in 2005, as well as transfers out to capital projects and other projects that we have. As you can see again, our budget was $155.1 million at June 30. Uh, our actuals uh, for the year were just over $148 million, representing a positive budget variance of $7.1 million. At the meeting, we also discussed that of that $7.1 million um, positive budget variance, we do have $2.2 million set aside in fund balance for items that while we did not expend the resources at June 30, we do have commitments uh, through the evidence of purchase orders and contract commitments that relate to fiscal year 14. And we also stated that uh, about $1.8 million was budgeted for expenditures to ensure that we complied with our budget uh, in the event there were unanticipated expenditures that arose at year end. Uh, as a result, revenues exceeded expenditures uh, by approximately $984,000 increasing our fund balance, which we began the year at just over $51 million, increasing that balance to about $52 million at June 30, 2014, as shown on the bottom of the slide. This particular slide represents uh, the details associated with our general fund fund balance. Um, this information can be found on page E1 of the city's comprehensive financial report, but we've summarized it tonight for your information as well as the communities. Um, there are several components to fund balance, and we've discussed those in a previous work session. Um, the one that council uh, is 
most interested in when we've spoken in the past is unassigned fund balance. So out of the, if you look in the 2014 column of the PowerPoint presentation, uh, out of the $52 million in total fund balance, about $19.4 million relates to unassigned fund balance. And what that simply means is that that's the amount of fund balance that we have that isn't committed uh, for future expenditure at this point through appropriations for the annual operating budget or capital projects. It's not restricted by state law for whatever reason, whether it be it's associated with encumbrances or receivables. It truly represents the amount of fund balance that you have available to appropriate that has not been committed otherwise. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry? I, I'll try to proceed quickly. If, unless, was there a question? I'm sorry. Okay, um, so at June 30, uh, un, unassigned fund balance represented about 13.9% of the current year, of that year's fiscal year expenditures and transfers out. And then there's uh, 2013 data provided for comparative purposes. And unless there's a question, I will move to the next slide. So just in summary, um, you have received a um, hard copy of the 2014 Comprehensive Annual Report. Um, we've shared with you some summary information in this meeting and in the previous meeting. What we would ask you to do tonight, uh, with your concurrence, we would ask that you accept the Audited Comprehensive Financial Report, that being one action item, and then uh, a, section a, a second action item we're requesting is that you would direct the Public Works Commission to provide regular updates on corrective action plan and a confirmation of completion of the two audit findings. And what we're proposing is that they report back to you uh, by January 31, March 31, and May 31st. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Uh, now I'm ready, Mr. Mayor. Okay, Mr. Moan and Mr. Colvin, did you have questions? Just one quick question. Okay. It went back to the one of your earlier slides where it said you know, showed that we had just under a million dollars um, revenues and other financing sources over expenditures. Yes, sir. So that's money that we didn't initially anticipate. So in theory. This city council at a later meeting could do a budget ordinance amendment and say allocate 500,000 of that back into our street resurfacing fund that we took out this year to put towards the um, the pool. I mean, is that an option? Yes, uh, fund balance is best used for a one-time purpose, uh, something that's not associated with a recurring commitment. So that would be a, a good example of what you could do with that fund okay. balance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moan. Mr. Ark. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I would move that the council accept the FY 2013-2014 uh, comprehensive annual financial report as presented and that the council direct the Public Works Commission to provide uh, an initial and on a quarterly basis an update on the two deficiencies that were identified in the audit uh, beginning in January. Okay, Is there a discussion on the motion, please? Seeing none, I'll ask for your vote. That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Item 8.03 is to modify the standards for utility trailers. Welcome, Ms. Hilton. Thank you. Um, rather than pull up the PowerPoint, I just uh, sort of bring you up to date. This item was part of an ordinance that you took up at your last meeting. It is the only part remaining. The questions that you had about the item, uh, that's about the storage of utility trailers in residential neighborhoods, was about parking on the street and what some of the other communities around us are doing. Um, to gather the latter part, we had to reach the code staff, who are usually out in the field. And I went back around because of some of the questions that came up in the nuances and details. Um, parking on the street, they are licensed uh, to be towed behind a vehicle, then they can be parked on the street, generally attached to the vehicle because that's part of the movement, the, the automobile part. Um, they can also be parked on the driveway as a motorized vehicle there. What we are proposing, because there are three different sections of the code, 
they don't necessarily conflict, but they leave small utility trailers sort of in a vacuum. Uh, there are a number of instances where there are that are unable to get them to the backyard, so we are proposing that one utility trailer, single axle, be allowed to be parked in the front yard if there is no access to the side or the rear yards. Of the three communities that got back with us this past week, uh, two are very similar or even more restrictive. One has almost no regulations speaking to utility trailers. Um, the two that are similar are Winston-Salem and Wilmington. Um, they limit, they vary a little bit, there's no apples and apples here, but they do limit parking in the front to either not in the front yard or one vehicle. Um, and in both cases, they limit the number on site overall to uh, one more in the backyard or two total, uh, depending on the community. Uh, since they are relatively consistent, and uh, we think that this will address the issues in a very limited fashion, uh, we do recommend approval of the proposed amendment. Thank you. Mr. Chris? Ms. Hilton, did you, did you just say that in the, in the cases where the property owners have these trailers but do not have access to park them in the backyard, they can get an alibi, if you will, and to park them on the driveway and in the yard? Is that, did I understand that correctly? Yes, the proposal is to recognize uh, that in some instances you cannot get to a backyard or a side yard. In that instance, if you have a single axle utility trailer, the ordinance would allow you to park it on an improved surface, it needs to be all weather, such as your driveway or parking pad in the front yard, but limited to one small trailer. When you say improved surface, would that include a gravel driveway as well as a it could, concrete yes, or? Yes, all weather. Mm -hmm. Okay, but not on a dirt driveway? No, it? or the grass. Or the grass. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chris. Mr. Hurst. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Ms. Hilton, um, I think from discussions, most of the discussions I've heard, I guess the related business might be landscapers uh, that have, that store their equipment on trailers in neighborhoods. And since we do a lot of business with landscapers and the most popular trailer, single axle trailer that that they use <coughs> 16 footers so in essence if there was access to the back of the yard they could they could store if a, if a landscaper decides he wants to be the be the location for his employees he could have two or three in the backyard one on the side yard and one in the front so in essence four or five single axle 16 foot trailers on his property and with this new ordinance be okay correct he has access to the rear yard, so he would be limited in the front. He could keep it on its driveway as one operating vehicle, um, but he wouldn't have access to the additional parking area. Uh, he has access to the side or the rear yard, so not in the front. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurst. Mr. Moan. Thank you for the presentation and the discussion again. And I'm trying to think back to our, our unified development ordinance. We had discussions about what a, a side yard was and whether it began at the, the you know, from the very furthest front piece, like a front porch, because sometimes a front porch will extend beyond um, the, the front of the, of the garage. And so do we know the definition of a side yard? Um, I, I believe back then it was measured from the furthest structure or portion of the structure closest to the street so if you had a front porch that stuck out 10 feet you could actually and you had a garage recess 10 feet the side yard would actually go 10 feet in front of the garage because people will, people ask those questions when especially they get a ticket you know what's the side yard mm -hmm. and i'm trying to remember back to those udo discussions a couple of years ago the definition of the side yard. Uh, it's a refinement I don't run into every single day, but um, I think a covered structure such as a deck or a porch in the front begins the front of the house. There are some extensions such as eaves that can go into that front setback. Mm, okay. Um, and then the follow-on question was if a licensed trailer was 
tied, hooked to the truck, it could legally park every day in the street and Assuming parking is allowed on that portion on that street, right? A typical right. Fayetteville neighborhood where there's no parking restrictions, like That's my, my understanding. neighborhood. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moon. Mr. Colvin. Ms. Hilton, let me ask you a question. Section four B, number three, where it says under standards, it says part of this new ordinance is to allow up to one light duty single extra trailer. Uh, like is used for yard maintenance equipment or motorcycles, maybe stored in the front or co corner yard when access to the rear uh, prohibits storage. So is that saying that those are the only reasons or conditions why you can at least park the one trailer? So if you've got access to the rear of your house, then you can't even park the one trailer in your yard? The distinction starts to get into the nuancing here. Um, if it's licensed and operable, uh, those are key factors in both being on the street or being parked on your drive or in that storage area if you can't get to the back. If it's part of your vehicle, attached to your vehicle like you would be on the street, you could be in your driveway, even if you had access to the back. Um, so you could have your additional trailers in the back. If you didn't have access to the back, you could not have a, you know, it could not have a tag on the back. It could be for your personal use pretty much around the yard, say you had a very big, large site. Um, it could be detached from your car and stored there until you used it every other weekend or two or three on your driveway. If, if you didn't have access. But if I have access to my backyard, then the one trailer is not allowed in my front yard if it didn't have Except a tag. Except as it's part of your car being or, or truck being parked on the street and so on. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Wright. Okay, I just want to be absolutely clear on this well, because we're voting on it tonight. Uh, that this is saying that we um, could only have one trailer in the front yard. That's it. That's right. Or in the street. In the street, uh, as long as you have adequate parking right. space in the public right of way. Okay, so just and it's connected to a vehicle and it's licensed and it's operable. Okay, I got you. All right. Mr. Art. Ms. Hilton, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I just got a couple questions. So the intent of the ordinance is to have people not park the trailer in their yard, but if the trailer is a licensed trailer, they can park it in front of their yard on the street without issue. If there's parking allowed on that street, yes. So from an aesthetic standpoint, can. the question I'm asking is, how does that change the aesthetics of the neighborhood? The difference is the, the trailer is not parked 20 feet in the yard versus being parked on the street. I, I don't know that aesthetically that really changes anything. The primary uh, problem that the codes is encountering is the number of trailers detached being stored in the front yard area. Not attached to vehicles, not necessarily licensed but or But there's not. no requirement for the trailer on the road to be attached to the vehicle. Yes. My understanding is it must be it, to be parked on the street, to be considered parked on the street instead of storage, that it has to be attached to a vehicle. So, so I just want to make sure I'm clear. So if I, if I pull up with a trailer, which occasionally I'll borrow someone's trailer, and I pull it up in front of my property, and I disconnect my vehicle because I need to run to Lowe's to get something, that vehicle is technically in violation, and I could be cited for that, vehicle, that, that trailer sitting there. That's actually a police citation. And I'm, it would be up to police to do that. They handle the roadways. Code steps in if it's considered, like if you pull the tag off and somebody came by and slit the tires while you were at the store. Then it becomes a junk vehicle and codes could come by and take it. But well, see, there, therein lies one of the concerns I have is, is how do you enforce this? I mean, our, our police officers have a lot on their plate today. And so now we're going to ask them to ride around neighborhoods and enforce trailers parked on the, on the streets. And then code enforcement, we have a lot of code enforcement violations based on current ordinances that there's a disparity of the application of the ordinances because we get that feedback all the time, you know, on <coughs> signs and other things. And so now we're going to add something else that's going to require code enforcement. I, I just have some concerns that, you know, we're, we're, we're passing an ordinance here that I don't know that we can enforce and enforce it in an equitable manner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Ms. Jensen. 
I think you answered the question that I was getting ready to ask, and I'm just going to ask it over again to make sure. If somebody has two trailers and they can't get to their backyard, let's say they can't. So they've got one that they park in their driveway, and they can park the other one on the street if it is hooked up. That's my understanding. Okay. So if it is registered and it's not hooked up, it's it cannot be on the street. It becomes storage of a, of a non-moving vehicle. Okay. It becomes even for one night. It, 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 you understand where I'm coming from? Yeah. And and I guess where I'm what I'm seeing is that maybe you have let's say you have somebody that has three trailers and now it becomes an issue that they say well they're only going to let us have one trailer so now he's going to take his trailer <clears throat> and he's going to put them down the street of the neighborhood and now you have small streets in the neighborhood and you have people going this way and this way and you have a trailer blocking. So I guess that's the point I'm trying to make. Mr. McDougall. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be much of a problem, but it is a big problem. I, I currently have a, a neighbor with six cars, four of them on the street. When it comes time for a garbage collection, they have no place to put their garbage can so that they can be four feet away from anything except they come over to my place. <clears throat> Ticks me off. Cars or trailers? They have to move their mailbox over to the other side. It, it, it's, and I understand what you mean. And also, it doesn't look very well. My neighbors are complaining. They're saying, well, man, you on the council. You can't do nothing about these cars. No, I can't do nothing. I, I, it really does not make good for a neighborhood when you have all these pieces parked out there. And especially, trust me. Trash cans, mailboxes, all these other things that need to go on, all of a sudden can't go on with all these other people. I, I think we are forgetting all these other things. You know, yeah, I understand people want to be in business. One is enough. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. McDougal. Round two, Mr. Hurst. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, with all due respect, uh, Mr. Arp, uh, our small, limited staff of code enforcement do a great job, and they're not going to be all over the city and all the neighborhoods. Most of the calls that I receive are generated from the citizens who have issues with, for example, Mr. Grimm, who's in the audience, and, and uh, his neighbor had um, three detached uh, trailers in his front yard and an another one that was attached, uh, and you all saw all the pictures and other other calls that I've received in the com throughout the community on the same thing. Same thing with litter laws. Uh, they're out there. We have a litter problem. They're not being enforced. So um, a lot are generated by the citizens. And, I, and since uh, comparable communities like Winston-Salem and Wilmington uh, in, in size and scope uh, reached out to them, thank you, Ms. Hilton, for doing that, and they have re uh, more restrictive uh, than having one uh, single axle trailer in the front yard. I think this is pretty fair compromise. So thank you, Mr. Ms. Hill. Mr. Art. Yeah, I just, um, Mr. Hurst, thank you for uh, your comments, but uh, respectfully, I disagree. And uh, when it comes to uh, code enforcement, <coughs> one of the biggest complaints I get is from people over the issue of signs and what is allowed with signs and uh, and the impact that it has to their businesses and, and the city's unequitable um, application uh, of the ordinance in, in lieu of that. So I'm not saying that, that I think that this concept in principle is wrong, but, but I am concerned that one, can we enforce it? And then secondly, I think the car issue is another component of it. And so, you know, I don't have a lot of people knocking my door down over trailers in their neighborhoods, but I do hear a lot of complaints about cars. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right, seeing no other lights, <clears throat> Council, I'll go to you for action. Mr. Hurst. Um, Mr. Mayor, I move that um, we approve the proposed amendment as presented by staff. 
Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. McDougal. Discussion on the motion, please. Yes, sir. Mr. Crisp. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Mayor, I'm just, I'm in a quandary here. I'm just not sure. You know, I can put a sign on my front lawn that says, don't walk on the lawn. And the school kids will walk on the lawn anyway. How do I stop them from walking on the lawn? I could get a switch and go out there and whip them, and then I would be. I'm just, I guess my point that I'm trying to make is if we approve this change or this amendment, how do we enforce it? How do we really, really enforce it? All right? Um, do we call the police department and they come and they give the, the resident a warning? Do we call code, and code enforcement who comes and gives them a warning citation? It's just, I'm just not sure how we're going to be able to legitimately enforce this across the city. And I say this in the context, there are thousands of these trailers. There are thousands of people here who are gainfully employed through lawn service, their own businesses. And they're not out robbing and stealing. They're working. They're cutting lawns. They have meaningful jobs, and they've got people working for them. The guy that does my lawn has three trailers and five people working for him. He's got to park those trailers somewhere. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, sir. Mr. Colvin. Uh, you know, I kind of am torn to, uh, like my colleague, Mr. Crisp. I mean, I, I'm all for beautifying our neighborhoods, our community. Um, the one problem I have with this ordinance is the fact that if you have access to your backyard, that now, instead of me being limited to one, I'm, I'm not able to have any in my front yard. So at the end of my work day, I've got to unload my vehicle. Unless you clear this up, Ms. Hilton, because that's the, that's the question I ask. Um, if I have access to my backyard and if I don't have a tag on this trailer, I am prohibited from having at least the one, minimum one, that's been recommended. Is that, am I interpreting that correct? So that, that's an issue for me, that, that every day after work, you have to pull into your backyard, you have to unload this trailer with your lawnmowers on, and every morning I have to get up, open my gate, and come back on. Um, so I, I'm all for the regulation. I think this may go a bit far, in my opinion. And if we, if we had some compromise, that, that, that might be a little more amenable to that. Mr. Colvin, I just want to make sure that uh, you and the rest of the council understand that in your example, the uh, landscaper comes to his house and he does have access to his backyard, but he still could park his uh, trailer hooked up to his truck uh, on his driveway. That's not an issue. If it has a tag. If it has a tag. Now, if it doesn't have a tag, he sh shouldn't really be ta toting it on the street anyway. I don't have tags. So Mr. Mayor, can I? Uh, no. <clears throat> press, your, press your light, please. Okay. Good. Mr. Hirsch? Um, Mr. Uh, Schufer had come up to the front. I think Mr. Mayor, uh, during the discussion, talk about Mr. Arp's concern about enforcement, which would be the argument when we uh, deal with vehicles in the front of apartment complex, uh, 160 feet or 170 feet from my house, six vehicles in the front. Now, my, my argument would be, well, we can't enforce it, so they can park as many vehicles in the front of their property as they want. So how are we going to enforce this uh, ordinance? Well, we, we would go out and it would, of course, depend upon the status of the, the, the trailer. If it doesn't have a tag, then, um, uh, then that's one case. If it's parked in the wrong place, that's another. The, uh, the way we would enforce it is the way we do almost anything else. We uh, provide them with a, a, a notice that gives them a period of time to cure the violation. If they don't cure it, then uh, we take uh, action to, to start a fining process. And, Ultimately, if we have to handle it ourselves, we do. Um, we do that with junk vehicles, with uh, junk trailers, and other things uh, currently. But the intent behind this was to try to reach some balance. 
The good news about trailers is that unless they're inoperable, uh, they're pretty easy to move. And uh, I, really what it comes down to, it sounds like to me, is uh, whether council, your, your, your concerns seem to be to what level of commercialization of residential property you want to uh, consider to be appropriate. Uh, because we are talking about working trailers, not necessarily um, ones that are used um, for recreation. And how will you define those? A boat compared to an enclosed trailer? Well, a boat compared to a utility trailer, it could uh, clearly it would apply to the recreational vehicles as well, but the discussion has been about um, uh, commercial ones. Okay, thank you. Mr. Moan. Question. If this passes tonight, I believe it becomes effective pretty much immediately. And what I'm concerned, and here's where the you know, question is, this is a new ordinance that the public does not know about. It has not been publicized. We have not gone on a radio. We have not gone in the newspaper. We have not put it out through our community watch groups that this is happening. And so should this pass tonight, I, I would ask that there be a, a six-month or a three-month, some appropriate amount of time. Again, this is a new ordinance potentially. So my neighbor with three trailers, I mean, as an example, Tomorrow he wakes up and he's out of compliance. A code enforcement comes by, slaps on, you know, you got 10 days, correct this. And it's like, well, when did this happen? Oh, it happened last night. Versus just like any other thing else, we talked earlier about amortizing tobacco stores. They've been legal. And we're going to do it over a three-year period. So is it possible that we don't make an effective gate? Should it pass tonight um, immediately or that we direct staff to come out with some type of public campaign, something to let the citizens know we're doing this, because 99.9% .9 of citizens are not watching this meeting. Is that a possibility? Thank you, Mr. Moan. Mr. McDougal. Yes, Mr. Mayor. You know, my neighbor directly across the street from me, he does my yard, and he does this kind of business, and uh, he parks his trailer at a storage facility and uh, unloads, and then he comes home with his truck. Now, there are occasions when he, um, you know, a little, runs a little late, and I think he parks his trailer. He backs it all the way in his backyard, opens up his gate and backs it in. But normally, the cost of doing business, he, he stores his trailer at a storage facility. It's just the cost of doing business. Thank you. Mr. Ark. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yeah, this is all some, some very good input, and, and I guess um, – I just I'm not comfortable that I've that I'm fully comfortable with what we're asking here it, with the impact to utility trailers and, and Mr. Schufer, did you mention that this will also would apply to recreation trailers? Yes, sir, it will. So if, so if I have a small trailer, and let's say I, I'm a, a kayaking enthusiast or I'm a bike enthusiast, and I have a small trailer that I put my bikes on, now I would have to. Uh, I would have to park these in the back of my yard. I mean, one of the concerns I have is now we're going to ask people to drop those. Because if I, I, I hear what you're saying about a small business, they can go and rent a storage building. But if I'm a recreational user, now i got to drive through my yard with my trailer. Because some of these trailers are a little bit too large to hand push. Or if you live on a hill. So now i got to drive through my yard, which means i got to have access to my backyard. So if I have a fence, that's an issue. And now when we're driving through my grass, aren't, aren't you going to get upset about people driving through their grass and now they got a, a worn path? So I'm just, yeah, well, I'm just saying there's some, there's, some, there's some consequences, some second, third level consequences, and I just want to make sure we're all comfortable with it before we pass this. Thank you, Mr. Wright. <clears throat> Ms. Jensen. Okay, mine goes again on the lines of Council Member Arp. Um, Mr. Schufer, my question is, again, with the recreational vehicles, I'm going to take it one step further. Um, like in my neighborhood, we have these 300 homes that are zero lot lines. So you really can't – did I mess up? Does, uh, that You can't go really to the backyard then because you really can't drive yourself around the backyard. So if you have like – a boat 
and a motorcycle and a trailer. You can't, you really can't have all three of those in your yard, right? So you would have to find not storage. Not in your front yard. Well, you really couldn't get to your backyard on a zero lot line, could you? Uh, typically you do, and we have a different version of zero lot line than any place in the universe. Uh, and um, imagine that <laughs> it it it, um, it basically means that you you're able to um, create uh, lot sizes that uh, that maximize the density that's allowed in your your community. So normally well, in in our community, instead of there being one side yard where the house is on that lot line, uh -huh. typically we do have normal side and rear and front setbacks. Okay. Well, the the. <laughs> The 300 homes in my neighborhood, they're like, you know, it. They're close together. Yeah, well, the people that are seeing, if you're going to see it in the front yard, you're going to see it in the backyard. Everybody's going to see it everywhere, so it's not going to make a difference if it's in the front yard or the backyard. Um, yeah, the people would be, the people on each side would be upset. So I guess that was my question. So if you have a boat, a motorcycle, and a trailer, Two things have to go in storage. Okay. Miss Davy, did you have any questions? No, I'm okay at this time. Thank okay, great. Seeing none, Council, I'll call for questions. Everyone's had an opportunity to discuss this and ask for your vote, please. He called for a vote. Miss Davy? Miss Davy? Yes, I'm here. Green. <laughs> All right, with Miss Davy voting, that's seven to three. Those voting in favor are Miss Davy, Mr. Hurst, Mr. McDougal. Those voting against, Mr. Crisp, Miss Jensen, Mr. Wright, Mr. Art, Mr. Robertson, Mr. Colvin, Mr. Moan. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Item 8.04 is the, to move back into closed session. So move, Mr. Moore. So move. It was uh, postponed from earlier or continued from earlier. So uh, we have a motion. Is there a second? Yes. Second. Second by Mr. Colvin.